Welcome to my presentation of the elements of writing memoir. My name is Casey Rogers, and I wrote a memoir called Our Better Selves From Secrets and Lies to Healing and Forgiveness. What I learned through the process of writing the memoir is that writing a compelling memoir really introduces a lot of the same elements of fiction. You might want to present your story, but nobody's going to want to read your story unless you have something that drives the narrative. So I've put together this presentation, and I've actually taught this as a course on multiple occasions. It will show you how to use some of the elements that you would use in a fictional story, but apply them to nonfiction. And that is who I am. So a lot of people have a difficult time differentiating between an autobiography and a memoir. And the difference is, is that an autobiography basically tells your reader the timeline of your life. So you would include elements about maybe where you were born and how that had an impact on your life. You know, you would chronicle events and things of that nature in an autobiography. However, in a memoir, what you're addressing are certain themes and a period of time in your life that you want to convey to your reader about events that happened. There are lots of reasons a person might want to write a memoir. A lot of it has to do with untangling events. You might want to consider writing a memoir for emotional healing without putting down things on paper. Memories are just in bits and pieces, but sometimes it gives you an ability to piece together a series of events and have an idea of how this impacts you. You might want to do it to preserve a family legacy. Maybe there's something that you want to chronicle that happens that had an impact on um, society as well. You might want to heal from a traumatic experience, or it could be something that's even, even funny or engaging. It doesn't necessarily have to be about like deep emotions, but the difference between memoir and autobiography is that you're discussing a particular period in time. There are lots of reasons not to write a memoir as well. You don't want to make a memoir about self-pity or revenge or because you think you're going to make a lot of money doing it. Unless your memoir is a huge success, you're not going to be able to make a lot of money, if any money at all. It's not a rant session. You don't want to write a memoir thinking that you're going to get revenge on some something. You have to realize that it's a lot of work so that if you're doing a memoir, you know, like there's a lot of time involved. So if, if you're writing just for, again, you know, kind of like revenge or trying to get back at somebody by telling, telling on them, you know, certain secrets or something, it's not really a, a worthy goal of, of writing a memoir. So there is a, a distinct difference between fiction and creative nonfiction, and memoir falls into the category of creative nonfiction. So obviously fiction is a story that you've made up that even if you are basing it sometimes on real life characters, you're not saying that what you're chronicling in your story represents what happened in real life. However, in creative nonfiction, you need to be as truthful and as factual as possible. So you might apply all of the same elements that you would in fiction, but you apply them a little bit differently in creative nonfiction because you have to tell the truth. That is the goal of creative nonfiction, that you want to tell a story, but you need to stick to the facts. And as much of creating or representing the truth as possible. So 
there are a lot of elements that we can use in creating compelling uh, creative nonfiction. The first thing that I always like to talk about because people get it a little bit confused is the structure. You don't necessarily have to do things in chronological order. You can weave things back and forth between the point in time that you decide is your narrative present and the narrative past. And what I mean by that is simply this. When you're starting your story, even if it's something that in reality happened in the past, that is your narrative present. So for an example, in my book, Our Better Selves, I started the narrative present in the year 2010 in Alexandria, Ontario, even though when I was writing the story, it was actually January of 2020. So the narrative present of my story was what was going on in the moment starting in August of 2010. However, throughout the story, I make references to things that happened in the past, such as when I first got married and, you know, jobs that I had prior to getting married and when I had my twins. So all those things were part of my narrative past, but the narrative present that I was in was in 2010 when I was writing the story. And you can fluctuate throughout the narrative between these things as long as you keep in mind that your narrative present doesn't go ahead of time. So I wouldn't talk about things that happened, say, in 2015, if I was right, like as I was writing the story. One of the things that you want to be aware of, like when you're writing your memoir, is the place and setting. So you want to pick some place that um, represents kind of like a large chunk of your story so that you can ground your reader in where you are at that particular moment in time. You need your reader to get a sense of what you're experiencing around you. And I'll use another example from my own book. When I began my story, I was actually in the restaurant that I owned up in Canada called the Two Beans Cafe and Tea Room. And that's where a lot of my story takes place in the beginning of the story. So it gave the reader a sense of engagement because I was able to anchor a lot of my emotions in the experience of things that were going on around me to that central place and that central time. So that's a way that you can use time and place in your story to anchor your reader into what's going on around you so that they feel connected to you. You also want to introduce particular characters in the beginning of your memoir. So you yourself as the writer are also a character when you're creating memoir, but you might want to introduce the central characters in your story as well. For me, that was relating what was going on in my marriage and talking about my husband. So in the very, very beginning, he became a central character in my story, as well as my children and the friends that I had up in Canada at that time. So you want to flush those people out so that your readers understand who you're talking about and what the links are to your particular story. And you also have to kind of create a plot when you're writing memoir. And the reason why you want to create a plot is because, again, you want to create a compelling story. So when you're developing your story, and this doesn't necessarily have to happen in your very first draft, but you want to create your narrative so that you're not revealing everything right away and the reader has a reason to keep on turning the page. 
So if you tell your reader at the very, be very beginning of your story, everything that happened, and then the rest of it is just kind of an explanation as to why it happened, they might not want to continue reading it. But if you drive the narrative forward by using plot elements, you're going to get them to like continue turning the page. There's also um, a need in your story for conflict. Why would somebody want to read this story? Well, most readers read because even in kind of comedic thing, you know, there's, there's a sense of conflict. And who is going to want to find out more about what happened to you? And of course, you're going to resolve your narrative and wrap up your story by telling your reader what happened and kind of finalize things that, you know, they get a satisfaction of knowing the ending of your story. Obviously, your life didn't end but you're wrapping things up in terms of those particular events and the sense of completion of your storyline. Obviously, in a memoir, because you're the narrator, there's only one point of view. So you always write a memoir in first person. I have seen people try to do other things and it doesn't work. You have to be the narrator of your own story. You cannot possibly capture somebody else's point of view. You might be able to translate the events as they happened and try to explain what you thought was going on in their minds, but that's still your point of view. Another part of memoir are themes. You might create the story, you know, it could be a coming of age story. It could be about parenthood or hope or leadership or accepting change in your life. But you want to like weave themes throughout your story to convey kind of a cohesion to the narrative. So what is your story about? If you were to put down your story, what would the reader walk away with in terms of, oh, that was a story about, for an example, Mary Carr, she wrote a story called Lit or a memoir called Lit. And her memoir was about getting sober and about realizing that she was an alcoholic. And there are lots of other great memoirs that you can reference and very clearly see what their themes are. It's that ability to kind of capture in a couple of, you know, sentences, what is this story about? And you could have multiple themes, but it's the central theme that counts. The other thing that you have to be mindful of when you're writing a memoir is knowing who your audience is. If your audience is teenagers versus maybe, I don't know, like older adults or whatever, you want to present the information in a certain way. If it's um, geared more towards women or, you know, like a general population, you have to kind of know who your audience is, who your readers are going to be, because how you handle the material is going to matter. And also you have to determine what your goals are. You know, it's, it's like, is your goal for writing this memoir something personal that you never intend to get published. You never like want to reveal the things that you've written in your memoir. That's like a totally different thing than if your goal is to writing this for publication and having a wider audience read this. And you should determine that right away. Even though at some point it might change, you might start writing this out for just yourself and then realizing that your goals have changed, that you do want to get it published at some point, but you don't want to like be goalless when you start writing this. Know what your objectives are. 
Are you trying to untangle some painful memories or trauma? Or are you trying to create a compelling narrative that will be ready to be published when you're done? So you might have like these wonderful goals when you're starting to write a memoir, but if you're not going to sit there and write, you're never going to reach your goals. And a lot of people start out writing and they don't realize how difficult it is when they first begin and that it is a very time consuming process. And it's also sometimes when you're dealing with painful memories, it's, it can't be very traumatic because you're reopening up wounds that have kind of like either slipped from your mind or you've pushed them aside. So you have to be ready to kind of like be honest and examine those when you're starting out. And also it takes time to do this. You need to set aside time or have a goal that this is going to be an ongoing process. But if your goal is to finish and complete a memoir, be realistic about what can prevent you from achieving your goals. Another big thing about writing in general is called process. Everybody has a unique process. And the thing that I like to stress when I'm teaching this course is that your process is your process. You can read dozens of books that will tell you about another writer's process and how they achieve things. You can take to heart what they have to say, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be right for you. I remember listening to a friend of mine talk who has given many talks at libraries, and he talks about writing a first draft and then basically just throwing it out. I would be horrified doing that because when I sit down to write a first draft, all of the elements are kind of solidified in my brain before I put fingers to keyboard. That's his process, but it's not my process. And finding out what works for you is something that will serve you in any writing project. There are terms called, you know, plotters versus pantsers. Are you the type of person that likes to work off an outline? so that you know in act one, all of the different steps that need to take place for you to get to act two? Or are you the type of person that likes to kind of discover things as they go along? So you might not work heavily with an outline. In my own life, what I do is I use a little bit of both I have a really good sense of where everything is going to happen, but I don't write out a lot of details. So I plot according to a three or four act structure, or sometimes a two act structure, depending on what I'm working on. And I fill in the details as the project continues, but I don't necessarily find all of the very rich elements until later in the story. Another thing that you can do to kind of get things going is called free writing. So free writing is, I'm going to see if I can read this to you because it's important. So the term was outlined by a guy by the name of Peter Elbow. And let me just read this. It's defined free line of free writing as the consequence of writing is that you must start by writing the wrong meanings in the wrong words, but keep writing until you get to the right meanings in the right word. Only in the end will you know what you are saying. So basically, you're just allowing the words to flow from your mind. You might not nail it in the very, very beginning, but eventually you're going to distill what it is you really want to say as you allow those thoughts to enter your brain unencumbered. So it's a technique that you could use for creating a memoir by just doing free writing or starting with free writing. And 
that brings me to how to free write. So what you can do is you can start by writing down the various ideas that you think about whatever topic is that you're writing about. You can write in sentences or paragraph forms. If you can't think of what to write, you might just want to keep on like writing down the subject and keep going for a certain period of time. It might be two minutes, it might be five minutes, it might be 10 minutes, but just focus on getting some words down about a particular topic. And remember, this is not something that anybody else is going to read. You can rip it up. You can throw it in the fireplace. This is just to open up your mind and get the work flowing. It's a place to start. So one exercise that I've used with my classes is that you can write. I want them to sit down and write on a topic for 10 minutes. And again, nobody's going to read this, so you don't have to worry about it. So one exercise that we do is write about yourself from your nose to your toes, or you can pick a random word from the dictionary and use it in your first storyline. Another thing that you can do is look at the place in which you're writing and start describing it. So those are three exercises that you can try if you've never done free writing before just to get the hang of it. Another thing that is really helpful when you're creating a memoir is to basically create a timeline. And this is really useful because, again, you might bounce back between your narrative present and your narrative past. And if you start with your narrative present, that's kind of like at the bottom because your narrative past are going to be things that happened much earlier. So again, for me, my narrative presence started out with a day in August in 2010, and it ended, my narrative present ended in October of 2021. That was my narrative present. But I also included things about my narrative past. I included things about my childhood. I included things about the day that I found out that my father died. I included things about the day that I got married or when I was introduced to certain characters in my story. So creating a timeline, getting those details will give you an idea of something to reference and go back to. When you get stuck, you you can say, okay, well, here's here I am with the story in my narrative present, but in order for my reader to understand what I am experiencing now, it would be helpful if they knew about something that happened in my past. So you can look at that timeline and you can say, aha, in order for my reader to know about this particular thing, I'm going to tell them about this thing that happened in the past. There's another tool that you can use to create a start for your story, and it's called mind mapping. So mind mapping is basically just starting with a central idea and then just building out from there about particular events. In some ways, it's kind of like a timeline, but it's not at the same time because what you're doing is, I don't think that you guys can like actually see this, but you're, you're coming like with the main character here. This is what this says right here. This is a main character. And then what you're doing is you're building out from, from there. You may not use all of the elements in your mind map but it's a great tool for reference so that you might need to reveal a certain detail about your main character. And because you've created a, a mind map about them, some of those details will be flushed out already to help you craft a compelling character. You know, if one of the elements of your character is that they have certain tendencies or a look about them or certain mannerisms, it can help bring your character to life. 
So mind mapping, whether it's for a character or for a setting, is a really great place to use a mind map, you know, to to extract all those details. You might be in a setting, for an example, I spent a lot of time in the hospital where my husband ended up. And I went and I created a mind map trying to remember all of the details about that hospital room. And it brings those details and those passages to life as I begin to describe where I am. So that's like a really great way for you to use mind mapping. I'm going to just read this off because it makes the most sense. There are basically five essential elements of characteristics of mind mapping. So what you want to do is you want to have a main idea, subject, or focus. So you have a very clear image of what you want to mind map. And then from out from there, your theme kind of radiates from that central image and you're creating branches. And the branches are comprised of an image or a keyword that are associated with that main idea. And then you might have things that are lesser important regarding that topic, but they're they're kind of like the twigs or branches that you can draw from or you can just leave it alone, but it's there for you to use if you need it. And they all have to relate back to that central idea or subject that you're focused on. So what is it about like maybe a particular character again? If you were describing your father, what are the things that made him unique? What did he look like? How did he sound? What were his interests? What was his personality? Those are kinds of things that you might put on a mind map. So in order to start mind mapping, what you want to do is you can use your computer, you can use a pen and paper, but start doing something like you, you might want to have it about your first house. Like where did you live as a child and what impact did where you live have on the rest of your life? Where you grew up is often very important in terms of how you viewed life. What was the outcome of certain events that happened? So as your mind map unfolds, you want to start writing down all of these details and making sure that you're capturing as many of those elements as possible, not necessarily that everything in your mind map is going to relate, be related in your story. It's a tool that you can use to go back to craft your story so that you already have these details, you've already fleshed them out. And it's a great way to start when you don't know all the elements of your story. So, you know, you, you want to think about different things on building out your mind map. So think about who was involved, where did it take place, and what happened. So if what you're doing is you're starting to work on maybe um, a mind map that has to do with a certain event, those are the kinds of things that you want to build out. Who was involved? Maybe this was um, an event that happened between you and just one other character. So you want to talk about like, where were you when that happened? That could be relevant. It might not be relevant. But again, it will give you a place to kind of go back to and then describe what happened. You might put a branch, you know, what was the conversation like? Was it tense? Was it funny? Did you end the conversation more as friends, as enemies? Or was there a lot of conflict that was drawn out of this conversation? So those are ways that you can start building your mind map. On to structure. Again, structure is one of my favorite things to do when I'm I'm working on a new project because I think it's a, a critical element. A lot of people write without structure. They just get it all down 
and then they build the structure of their story. Because I've written plays, I tend to like to think of a uh, structure in acts. And I'm not the only one that does this. Um, they also use this for creating um, screenplays. So structure, again, is how are you going to build the narrative of your story in revealing certain things along the way so that you're driving your readers in a particular direction when you're telling your story. So as your story unfolds, you want to hit certain plot points and pinch points and other elements so that the narrative arc of your story and your character are always moving forward until your climax. And then you're basically wrapping up the story. So I already kind of covered this, like in terms of why you want to use a three-act structure, but here is a three-act structure. So when I write, and again, you, you have to do your own process, but whatever works for you, you start with the inciting incident. What was it that opens up your story? You want to pick a point in time that will launch the story and move it forward. So for an example, in my memoir, the inciting incident for my story was finding a notebook that had my husband's passwords to his email address so that I was able to go in and read his emails and find out about things that had, you know, he was telling other people that unfortunately weren't true. So that was the inciting incident that kind of crystallized the opening of my um, memoir. That's called an inciting incident. Then you use the particular points within the structure. They're all outlined here. So I don't necessarily, you know, want to focus too much on that diagram. But so when you're setting something up in the first act, you want to consider you know, the exciting, uh, inciting incident, um, then a particular plot point. For me, a plot point happened at the end of the first chapter where I revealed that in the past, my husband had left me for another woman. So that drove the narrative forward and I considered it a plot point. And then in terms of exposition, you want to understand like where the story is starting and getting the reader involved in your particular moment in time. So you're setting things up with a lot of like different elements in the beginning and giving your reader a sense of who you are as a character, where you are as a character, so that when you drop in that inciting incident, they're grounded in your story already. I will also make this PDF available so you can see some of these things. So in Act 2, once you reach Act 2, you usually want to outline some kind of like a confrontation and you keep on raising the stakes and or, you know, you have the rising act action and that's the part of your memoir where you begin to share your journey with the readers, telling them about, about particular events that happened and took place in pursuit of your goals and the obstacles that you faced. You can also include references to the narrative past to provide your reader with context and insight. And by the time you get to the midpoint of your story, the midpoint takes place in the middle of the story and is a significant event that should take place in that particular point in my story and our better selves. It was when the reader learned and I learned at that particular point that my husband had cancer. And that was like a very significant thing because as I was unfolding the narrative, I thought something else was going on that was driving the narrative forward and creating the conflict 
when in reality we found out that he had cancer. And then in act two, you also want to reveal um, another plot point. So you want to expand on the challenges that you faced because of the event. Again, for me, it was like, well, what are the challenges with now realizing and finding out that my husband had cancer? One of them was getting him diagnosed at a different hospital because the hospital he was at didn't have an oncologist um, or they only had a part-time oncologist and, you know, getting him transported from the area that we lived in back to Massachusetts. So that was a way to show the different challenges that I had in this situation. Then moving on to, uh, to Act 3, you want to start to resolve what happened. So you've been building and building and building, and then you come to the climax of your story, and you start to resolve everything from that point on. What happened after this major event or the climax? This is where you show your reader your different fears and your flaws. And because you're the protagonist of your story, you want to make this kind of like, it's not that it was insurmountable, but you are trying to come out of this live, if, if that makes sense. So when you finally do get to the climax, you're telling your reader you know, what your main conflicts were and how you dealt with them, basically, um, and how you resolved the things that were going on in that particular time. And then the announcement, you, you basically have to make sure that when you're writing memoir, you're not leaving your reader hanging. You want to make sure that you're wrapping things up so that they're not necessarily, you know, getting to the end of your book and saying, okay, so what happened next? Because an unsatisfying conclusion can really put a reader off. And you might want to, like I, what I did in Our Better Selves was I included an epilogue so that even though it ended at a particular point, the story itself ended in October of 20, um, 2011, I included an epilogue so people knew what happened after that. And my thoughts, it gave me a chance to kind of wrap up certain thoughts I had about the events that had unfolded. So with all that being said, <laughs> there are other things that you need to pay attention to when you're writing a memoir. And one of the most critical things is the narrative voice and tone. If you're trying to write a memoir and you're not authentic in your voice and tone, it's going to come out wrong. You want to sound like you. You don't want to try to sound like somebody that's more educated, less educated, or um, flip or you know, talking in a way that you normally don't, unless that's the way you really talk. You want to be authentic about expressing your way in the way that you would express it rather than somebody else expressing it. So using certain words, using expressions that you would use, not repetitively, but at least to flavor your narratives. And you also want to create like a tone that is authentic to you. If you are a very kind of warm, fuzzy person, you want to convey that in your narrative. But if you're somebody that maybe deals with things a little more detached, that might be the tone that you want to create here. But the most important thing is that it represents who you are. It's your voice and tone, and it's what makes you unique and why somebody might come back to read another piece of yours. So 
I'm just going to read this off. And it's basically, you know, while it might sound simple because all members, memoirs are written in first person and the narrator it is you, when we think about tone, we can all sound differently in different situations. You might speak to your boss at work differently than you would speak to your teenage son. You might sound differently before and after your morning coffee. I know I do. <laughs> So it's important to try to capture the you in these situations so that it reflects your emotion and the way that you would present yourself in a given situation. Don't sanitize your words or try to sound lofty. Try to capture the way that you actually speak. And as you write a memoir, think of how you would speak to a friend rather than how you would craft a business letter or speech. One of the questions that I get asked all the time is when you're writing a memoir, how do I tell the truth when I don't always remember what happened? And this is very concerning, you know, because there have been memoirs that have been written that people have found out later that they weren't exactly factual. And so the goal of memoir is not to tell fiction. The goal of memoir is to tell your story as authentically as possible. So the way that you can do that is if you can't recall something that is an exact detail, did this person wear a red dress or a blue dress? Did this person wear glasses or not glasses? If you can't remember a particular detail, you can either leave it out or if it doesn't change the story and what happened in any way, it's okay to write down a detail, even if it isn't accurate, because it's not going to matter whether somebody was wearing a red dress or a blue dress for the most part. And you can tell your story as honestly as possible, as long as you're conveying the right tone of the events. If you are in a situation and you are trying to recreate dialogue and the person was screaming at you, but you presented that they weren't screaming, that's not honest. If they were screaming, you have to say they were screaming. You're going to remember that detail. But if you can't remember a detail about what their tone was, and it's not something that relates to an important fact in the story, then either eliminate it, or you can even honestly say, I don't recall this particular thing because maybe, you know, like it, it seemed insignificant at the time. Another thing that you have to be really careful about when you're writing memoir is that because you're dealing with people that might read it eventually, is you have to decide whether you want to include things like names of like real people in your life, whether you want to write it under a pen name, because you might reveal things that are very hurtful to other people. And they might come back at you like either with anger or resentment or whatever. So you have to consider what's at stake when you're revealing certain things from your point of view about what happened and somebody else in your family or your friend might have taken a totally different point of view when you know that situation came up so another thing that you want to think about when you're writing your story it's and, and this is a element ripped right off of fiction it's basically conflict state mistakes and beats. So the conflict in your story, if it only has one level of emotion, then nobody's going to read it. It's going to get monotonous or boring. And the way to create conflict and stakes and beats, or by doing that, what you're doing is you're creating a rhythm of your story. You are making it interesting for the reader, reader and you are moving the narrative forward. So in terms of conflict, you know, you might have like a life or death situation or they could be internal dramas or dilemmas. 
like in my story, I thought something was going on that to this day, I still don't know whether what I thought actually was going on, but that was like a conflict that I had. I wanted to know the truth about something and I was having a difficult time finding out the truth, but it could also be an external conflict. Maybe, you know, something happened that changed the course of your life. Maybe, you know, your house burned down or, or maybe you were assaulted or maybe you met somebody that you thought was a totally different person than they ended up being. So the, and there can be conflict between characters. Maybe, you know, your parents went through a divorce and you always thought that it was justified on your mother's side, but then you learn certain things about your mother that you didn't know before. So all these things are basic conflicts that you can weave into a story that's going to make it interesting for your reader. And really, conflict is one of the most important aspects of writing memoir because you want to, again, give your reader not just the facts of what happened, but a reason to keep on reading your story. And without conflict and without identifying things that you were experiencing in terms of the conflict in your life, then your reader's not going to have um, a reason to be engaged. So external conflicts, they should be very specific. It should be very engaging, serious, urgent, and personal. And again, I'm going to make these notes uh, available, but you know, it could be internal. It could be something that's very emotional. It could also be like a moral thing. You know, for me, when I was writing or when I was experiencing what I wrote about, I had some choices, some really, really difficult choices to make in my life at that particular point about whether I stayed in the marriage or whether I should leave the marriage at a particular point. So I had all of these very internal conflicts and a moral dilemma because of marriage vows. So another thing that, you know, most fiction writers are aware of, but they can be used in creating memoir as well, are stakes. And stakes are the negative consequences of failure. So if I fail at this particular endeavor or what happens, what is the cost, basically? And it shows in your story that what you could gain or lose based on the central conflict of the story. And another way to very succinctly explain stakes, it's basically two, two dogs, one bone. Then a beat, another thing that we use um, in fiction, is a moment that propels your story forward and makes your reader wonder what happens next. Beats help identify important moments in our stories, showing us the key emotional moments that we've experienced so that we can expand on those moments in a particular scene or setting with details. Beats also provide an opportunity to incorporate a pause that gives your uh, reader a moment to react to a particular situation to what happened to you. And the type of beats that we normally would put into our writing are events. Um, those offer an opportunity for characters to express their views or desires, interact with secondary characters, or to advance the narrative realizations that's another thing are moments that occur after reflections that help us make decisions based on what happened these are often referred to also as takeaways so what did you learn from that particular thing that happened at that time and that's kind of like the gold of a mem a goal gold of a memoir that the takeaways are those things that your readers can say this is what the writer learned, and this is something that I, I could possibly learn from their situation as well. Resolutions are also a type of beat where you can express your desire for things to change. And interactions, 
what helped you shape what happened to us throughout the memoir. You could be interacting with a person or an event. How you reacted is referred to as a beat. Place and setting. I can't emphasize enough that these are details that are really going to enhance your memoir. Because where you are at the particular moment that you're writing throughout the different scenes really reflect or are placed to hang certain things that affect you. It shows your reader whether you were comfortable, uncomfortable, and what was what was going on externally around you that could have an impact on your emotional well-being. For an example, in chapter one, in the opening of my memoir, I was in a hot, sweaty room in the upstairs office of the cafe that I used to own. And I was miserable. It was at the end of August. It was so hot, but I didn't want to go downstairs with, where it might be a little bit cooler because of the emotional conflict I had with seeing all the boxes packed because I was leaving to return to the United States. So the setting and the time and place really set so much about what my story was about and how I was being impacted emotionally by just the presence of where I was, this tiny, hot, you know, smelly room. And that gets me to, you know, when you talk about, you know, different characteristics of place and setting, use your senses. Adding sensory elements to a memoir is a beautiful and fantastic way to engage your reader in what you are experiencing. So if you provide the reader with all of these little details about what were you smelling at the time? What did you see at the time? Like what were the visuals? What was your, what were you hearing? What were you smelling? What did you feel? Like, like were you wrapped in a, a nice soft blanket or, you know, were you covered with a wool blanket that was scratchy and itchy? So all of these you know, are elements that you can use to basically enhance place and setting to engage your reader, to give them a sense of where you are in your mind emotionally and, and hang their emotions as they're reading your story. So one of the memoirs that I've read that I think had a really big impact on engaging me which I actually read after I wrote my memoir, but I, I often reference it in teaching, is a memoir by a woman named Anne Lamont called Bird by Bird. And the reason why I reference this is because she tells a very compelling story about her younger brother who um, had a school project. And like many young kids, they don't start it until the night before. And the project happened to do with maybe identifying you know, birds of North America or something like that. And he was upset and in tears and, you know, complaining to his mother or father. And it's the question was raised, well, how am I going to get this done? And the parent advised them bird by bird, you know, you're going to take one step at a time. And that's how we build on things. You're not going to sit down and write the first draft of your memoir without examining some of the things that I talked about before. And I've given you the tools like mind mapping or free writing or setting up a timeline. Those are birds. Those are things that you can use to start your process and create an idea in your mind of where you want to go with this particular project so that you can get started on it. Another thing that you should be aware of is creating what's called a sloppy copy. Do not worry about creating a wonderful first draft. If you keep on rewriting the first two chapters over and over again, because they're not perfect, you're not going to finish the project. You're just going to have these two beautifully crafted, 
first chapters, but you're not going to get to chapter three, four, five, and six. Write out your story. It doesn't have to be perfect. You can do a sloppy copy just to get the story down. And then you can go back and start crafting the various elements within your story. You can change the setting, uh, not the setting, the um, structure of your story after you complete the sloppy copy. But it's most important to get that first draft done and don't let anybody read it. That's my advice because if you do, what's going to happen is they might discourage you from continuing. So just get the story down. Don't worry if there's spelling errors or punctuation or your syntax is incorrect, or you might not remember a detail or whatever, just get it down on paper or in the computer so you have something to work on. And as you have now crafted your first draft, then it's time to go in and start revising and editing. And there are books that I can point out later in the presentation that will help you revise and edit. You start with, you know, elements of macro elements, which are basically crafting the structure, you know, things of that nature before you start doing like the smaller things like line edits and, and things of that. So when you're revising, the revising involves the major parts of the, you know, stories, a uh, content, how it's organized. So when you're revising, you will rewrite entire sections of the work so that the purpose of that particular area might be more cohesive in terms of your ideas. You know, you might be adding or changing or deleting large sections of your work or moving them around. I'll give you an example. There was like one major detail in my story that I revealed. And in my first draft, I had it happening in the end. And, and, the, and I switched it to the opening chapter. So that's an example of revising. You want to look at the big picture of your story when you're doing um, revising. But your editing is more on sentence level changes. Does the particular sentence that you've crafted, does it convey what you mean to say properly? Does it, you know, is there a better way to make it more clear for your reader? Could I add a word or two that would give the reader a better sense of the emotion behind what I was experiencing? So, so that's what editing is versus what revising is. And then finally, if you're going to do this for, you know, like publication, my best advice is to hire a proofreader. Do not try to prove this yourself. Get it to the point where it's as polished as you could possibly get it and then hand it over to somebody else. And the reason for this is because you are not going to see the mistakes your brain is going to read something and read it differently than it's actually there on the page. And you need an outside person to pick up on those things so that when somebody else, like your audience is reading it, they're not reading it and saying, eh, that's really grammatically incorrect, or, you know, that should be, you know, a colon instead of a semicolon or whatever. So they're not picking apart your work on details that aren't really relevant to the overall piece. You know, some sometimes readers can get like that. You know, it's like, oh, it's an absolutely wonderful story, but, you know, I found a misspelling. So they can obsess about like the little mistakes in the work and not see the larger picture. So my suggestion is to get it professionally proofread before you put it out there. And that's pretty much it. So we will be taking questions and answers in this. And you can find out more information about my work at CaseyRogers.com. 
I have the memoir that I've referenced, Our Better Selves, From Secrets and Lies to Healing and Forgiveness. It's a project that I'm very passionate about because one of the central themes in my story is about financial abuse. And I've become uh, an outspoken advocate on trying to educate others about financial literacy and the impact of financial abuse on our society. So that's a book, but it's also a very compelling story. And you can see how I crafted this narrative. And then I also have another book out there called The Color of Frost, which is a work of literary fiction. So I thank you for listening. And that's it.